Hello, everyone, and welcome to the midweek program at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. My name is Blake. I'm the education assistant here at the Arboretum, and today we are in the geophyte border because we are having a garden conversations with Brent Heath, who is a bulb grower up in Virginia. We've got Dennis Carey, our curator of the Arboretum, who is going to be leading a conversation with Brent. Uh, Brent will be joining us over Zoom. So we've got this lovely little introduction shot, but we will then switch over to the Zoom feed and we'll have Brent and Dennis discussing bulbs and all things bulbs. And it should be a wonderful program. All right, I can hear people now. Brent, how are you today? I'm very well, Dennis, and you? Great, great. Good deal. Brent and I had a real nice conversation a few weeks ago in preparation for this uh, lecture or this interview. Um, and so I, I'm gonna give Brent and his family a little bit of an intro. And then we're going to, um, uh, I'll start asking him. I've got some prepared questions, but hopefully uh, you will have some, um, the audience here will have some excellent questions. I look forward to that. All right. So Brent and Becky's Bulbs is a uh, mail order bulb company out of Virginia. They're just north of Norfolk and they're right on the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, um they are, uh, uh, they've been in business for quite a while, not always as Brent and Becky's bulbs. Um, it started off with Brent's grandfather um, and then went to Brent's father. And then Brent took over the business back in, am I right in saying the 70s or is it the 80s? It was early 70s, 1972. I bought it from my mother. So my mother ran the show. My father raised daffodils. And my mother okay. ran the business, kind of like what we have today, where uh, Becky runs the show and I get to play with people and plants. Okay. And um, so, oh, yeah. Well, so, you took the business over in the 70s, and now you are entering retirement and you're passing the business on to your son, Jay. Yes, indeed. And uh, so, as you mentioned earlier, your wife, Becky, who's part of the eponymous uh, Becky, um, is uh, runs the day to day business right now. And Jay and his wife, Denise, also contribute quite a bit. Well, um, it's a four way partnership. Yeah. OK. And uh, let's see. So Brent was. Um, uh, 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 not trained as a horticulturist. Uh, he's learned everything uh, on the job, so to speak. Um, he got a School business hard degree. Knocks. <laughs> School of Hard Knocks. Uh, business degree from uh, Roanoke College in Old Dominion, and then spent some time in the Navy and then uh, went into the business. Uh, his wife, Becky, is actually a musician by training, um, has some degrees in um, uh, from... Mount, Montreat Anderson College, East Carolina University, and Virginia Commonwealth. Um, and Brent tells me that she is a multi-instrumentalist, a excellent singer, as well as a conductor. And a teacher for many years. And a teacher too. Okay, a, a music teacher too. So um, very, very talented. And uh, um, when I spoke with Brent earlier, he uh, sang his wife's praises, praises up and down. And uh, claims he couldn't do it without her. And then uh, his son Jay and uh, and Jay's wife Denise are um, in the business as well. And uh, I'm not sure how old are they. Are they like twenty one? Jay's approaching approaching fifty, and Denise is in her forties. Oh, okay. All right. Great. Oh, or so, Jay is in her early fifties. Sorry. Oh, and and um. You know, it didn't take me long to realize I didn't need to be in charge. Becky was a whole lot better suited to run a business than I. Very ordered thinker. Um, I like people and I like plants, and she enables me to do what I enjoy doing. And she enjoys the organization of running a business, along with Denise, who runs our retail shop and uh, coordinates events in our a uh, five-acre teaching and idea garden. There'll be a wine festival coming up in second weekend in September. Um, Jay, and she coordinates, she composes the catalog nowadays. So Jay does all the uh, internet 
um, connections and coordinates. Uh, he is our general manager and he interviews people who'd like to come and be on our team and then helps to figure out where they will enjoy working or playing with us the most. We, we do something that's fun. Oh, anyhow. And your business over the years has gone pretty heavy on the tech. You now do all your business. You, oh, you still have a catalog you mail out, but I, I imagine you get most of your business just through your website, right? Don't call on the place orders. We still get mail orders. We've got 20 or 30 mail orders every day still. Yeah. Um, a lot of you know, I, uh, but right before I came to the Arboretum, I worked at Plant Delights Nursery and um, same thing. Um, you know, they big website mail order uh, uh, business right now, uh, but they still have a print catalog and they still get mailed people mailing them their orders too. It's interesting how that works. Um, so uh, now when Brent and I were talking uh, a few weeks ago, we still do it. Uh, I um, there's a lot about the business I didn't know. I thought it was pretty interesting. I'll I'll um ask Brent a few quick questions before we start talking about plants, which is what I know y'all really want to talk about. So, um, uh, Brent and Becky's bulbs. How big is it, Brent? How many people work there? I think we're about fifteen full time, and then seasonally. In March, April, and May, our spring flowering, our summer flowering bulb season, we add another 10 or so. But in the autumn, we add another 20 sometimes okay. to fulfill the orders. Sure. So that is uh, if, um, about the size of Plant Delights, um, for those of y'all who are local who go there and, and know kind of that. Now, your, your property is quite large. How big is your property here? He just disappeared. I think Brent's uh, reconnecting. I'm going to go ahead and fill in some of these details because I know when he gets back on, you're going to want to talk plants. Um, so as he mentioned, they're 15 full-time and 20 or 30 seasonal. Um, they've got a lot of land up there north of Norfolk, right on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, they grow some of their own things there. Uh, and uh, But they also have partnerships with farmers in Holland and um, they uh, go over there and um, the, these people in Holland contract grow stuff just for Brent and Becky's. And then um, it gets shipped over a couple times a year. And then once it arrives here, they, they distribute it out. Brent, are you back? I can see you. Uh, you're okay. muted. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you now. Okay. Good, Good deal. So um, I was just telling him about, uh, you know, your, how you do, you have the contract growers over in Holland and, uh, but you also grow some stuff locally. Um, you are, um, uh, tell us about your catalog schedule. Well, our, our summer flowering bulb catalog comes out in January. We begin shipping March 15th and ship right up through May. And that's comprised of a lot of the tropical bulbs, many of which are tropical, but if we treat them properly, they are hardy in our zones seven and seven, seven through nine. Um, and then um, we ship right up until uh, the end of, end of May. Our, some, our spring flowering bulb catalog comes out in March, and we take orders, uh, offering early order discounts, et cetera. And then we begin shipping the spring flowering bulbs in September 15th, and we go right up until December. And one can still plant bulbs in zone seven, eight, and nine um, up through the month of December, pretty much. Uh, and so we are now here at the end of August. And so this, this September is coming along soon. So it's almost time to start planting or be thinking about planting those fall bulbs. Um, I got my order in with you guys a few weeks ago. Um, Good. And you, you were telling me a few weeks when we ago when we spoke uh, that there's going to be a few things that are in short supply this fall. Can you tell me about those? So Dennis, what, what has happened is... Um, there was an unusual growing season in the Netherlands, and tulips in particular 
Some of them are in short supply just because the bulbs didn't grow as well as they had hoped they would. Um, but we, Becky has been very busy. Becky and some of our telephone staff team have been very busy uh, when we sell out of something and somebody's ordered it. We either email or call them and say, sorry, that's not available. However, we do have this available as an alternate choice. Uh, unfortunately, many companies just substitute and don't tell you what you're getting. And often it's not as not very close to what you've ordered. Uh, but we do offer alternate choices for things that we have sold out of. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so, all right, that's I think that's about all I had for the kind of background. I thought that was really interesting, though, about you know it's you know three now four generations and how big they are and, and when they ship and stuff. So let's get into some plant questions. Um, and since uh, you start shipping here in a few weeks, uh, what are some good things for planting in the fall, both early and late fall? Well, um, planting in the fall. You know, all the spring flowering bulbs want to be planted when soil temperatures are typically, or most, I have to say, between 50 and 60 degrees. That's when the bulbs root the best. They root very fully within two weeks, and that's about the time of your first frost. However, we ship out culture combs and autumn blooming crocuses early on because they do bloom in the autumn, and they don't require the cool soil to bloom that first year. The others, the spring flowering bulbs require a cold winter vernalization. So, so many weeks of cooling to trigger them to bloom. And so you wanna plant, uh, so the bulbs make their good roots before the ground freezes. And then they get the vernalization that they need, the technical term for the preparation to bloom. And that typically takes for very early bloomers, maybe eight to 10 weeks of cold for mid-season bloomers, 12 to 14 weeks of cold for late bloomers, it actually takes a full 16 weeks. So that's from the time you plant them. So, um, you know, it's uh, not all things are created equal and we just have to keep in mind that, that um, uh, we do things a little differently for different types of bulbs, et cetera. Uh, so what are some um, bulbs that are really popular this year? Well, daffodils are always really popular. They're my favorite bulb. And for many people, they like them because predominant color of daffodils is yellow. They're one of the first things to bloom in the spring. Yellow is the first color your eye separates from the spectrum. And they are a wow factor when not much else is interesting in the garden. However, the daffodils that go through a full range of colors uh, with white and orange and, and red and pink cups and uh, varying shades of yellow and then white. But um, daffodils are also in the amaryllis plant family and are absolutely critter-proof plants. And some people do deer with Deal with deer, oh dear. We don't eat enough venison these days. Um, and deer sort of like our edge, our communities, which are communities at the edge of the woods. Deer are not woods critters, they live on the edge and they love where we build a lush garden on the edge of the woods. And they find many lush plants to come and nibble on. Well, they don't eat deer. I mean, they don't eat amaryllis family members, daffodils, and there are a good number of other amaryllis plant family members. The daffodils are sun lovers, however, and they're best planted in full sun. They, they, um, the solar collectors, the leaves, need to be have at least eight hours of sunlight a day to fully recharge the batteries, the bulbs, so they'll bloom again next year. The daffodils are their range of colors, their range of sizes, their range of fragrances. And I think fragrance is a very wonderful added value. Our hybridizing has been largely on multi-flowered because it's mostly the multi-flowered ones that are fragrant. 
and fragrant daffodils. They also tend, the multi-flowered ones, tend to have nice narrow leaves like my little finger, much easier to hide in the garden after they bloom, instead of the big wide leaves like my thumb, which are a little more difficult to mask. But um, that leads me to the fact that daffodils are great companion plants with many other annuals and perennials and ground covers and trees and shrubs and even vegetables. Um, we've got this wonderful term called foodscaping that Bree Arthur has taught us about. But there are many wonderful vegetables. I grow a lot of different lettuces. And after I plant modaffodils, I often sow lettuce seed right where I disturb the soil. Or kale is another wonderful one. Chard is another, beets. You know, there are a lot of a lot of vegetables with pretty leaves. So you can grow them all in the same bed together. Becky sometimes says, I put everything in bed together. She calls me an orgy gardener. But um, I want my gardens to be sequentially pretty. So after my daffodils bloom, I want something else coming up and following them. And then actually I do lasagna type gardening. I add... Uh, Plants and summer bulbs, so perennials, are ideal to follow daffodils, and they often hide those maturing leaves. You have to remember, those leaves are solar collectors, and if you tie them in knots or put rubber bands around them, they're not going to collect enough light to recharge, but also a chance for a fungus to get in and attack the bulb. So, anyhow, you asked me a simple question, and I gave you a long answer. No, that's good. And that takes us uh, in a lot of possible directions. Um, let's let's cover um, when to uh, manage your daffodil foliage at the end of the season. What's a good yes, sign indeed. that they're ready to uh, be, the foliage is ready to be taken up? Well, it, it studies at University of Delaware 30 years ago that we sponsored. Um, we planted daffodils in repetition and cut the leaves so many weeks after bloom. After 10 weeks of leaves being in place after bloom, uh, we didn't get any significant additional blooms. But if we cut them before 10 weeks, we got the fewer blooms again the next year. So um, typically in our climates, the end of May uh, or early June is good. As soon as you begin to see the tips of the leaves begin to yellow, they're shutting down, just like the leaves on the trees. When you begin to turn yellow and red, they're shutting down. They're no longer producing carbohydrates, sugars to go back to the bulbs. So when they're beginning to turn yellow, when they flop over, go ahead and cut them off, but never tie them in knots, never braid the foliage. All good advice. And uh, you had mentioned to me earlier when we were speaking that um, you could just leave the foliage on and just plant uh, companion plants that are coming into leaf at this time, same time, right? So daylilies come up companions. very quickly and come sequentially after the bulbs. So daylily daffodil plantings are ideal, but there are many, many perennials that follow in sequence. And, and actually the benefit is not only hiding the foliage, but also, using the available moisture from the summertime because a big enemy of daffodils is having too much water. Well, a big enemy for most plants. Plants' roots, uh, that when the daffodils go dormant, they like to sleep in a dry bed. And so if you have mindless irrigation putting water on them, often if it's hot and wet, they'll catch a fungus and rot. So no mindless irrigation, and perennials growing on top of them, vegetables, the cucurbits, the squash, the melons, the cucumbers are all great shade to keep the soil cooler and use the available moisture. Wildflower meadows, native plant meadows are ideal for bulbs in the early spring. And then you get the grass, ornamental grasses and perennial wildflowers that, that come in sequence afterward. So, we had a, a wonderful meadow uh, over a, a big daffodil bed that persisted here for years. 
Yeah, and meadow gardening gardening is so um, becoming so popular now. And, um, it, and it simplifies things. And Sanjay even has a machine, an established meadow that has roots that go down six inches. He has a machine that will lift up six inches of that turf, uh, meadow turf, and place the bulbs on the ground, come back and put it right back on, put the turf right back on top. So the bulbs will come up through that perennial meadow turf the next spring and they'll get their growth and the grasses and things will come up and hide. There's even a, a, a meadow, a park not far from you where he planted 50,000 bulbs. Um, I wish I could tell you its exact name and he's not here in the room with me right now. Uh, it just in got Raleigh thrown in the area. chat. It's called Dick's Park. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, I've been out there to see the sunflowers in the summer. I've yet to go out in the spring to see the daffodils. I think I'll have to put that on my calendar. I use sunflowers. I have a five acre field of daffodils that has uh, several thousand varieties of daffodils in it that I grow just for pleasure. And I pick some flowers for visitors and people who come on tours. But in any event, in the summer, I grow sunflowers, Sudan grass and soybeans in that same field to put more organic matter to sequester carbon with their roots during the summer, but also keep the bulbs dry. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so we've been talking about daffodil leaves. There's a question here in the chat from uh, Barbara uh, Alberton Grant uh, that says, are there any daffodils with short foliage? Yes, there are. Um, the cyclamenius types that are early bloomers typically have shorter leaves. Now, long leaves often happen when people plant them in too much shade. You know, see, they, the leaves stretch for the sunlight then and then tend to flop over. The jonquilla types have narrow, dark green leaves and are relatively short. Most of them, not all, but most. Um, the miniatures all have very short um, foliage. Mm -hmm. And miniatures are great. They they tend to be under six inches tall, and um, and some are wonderfully sweetly fragrant, and and um, and often do well, quite well in in dry gardens uh, like rock gardens, places like that where smaller is nicer. They're also great in containers. We do a bunch of container gardening with bulbs. However, when you plant the bulbs in a container, typically you leave them there for one season. Not the ideal place for them to multiply and continue to grow. We do a, a class called Living Flower Arrangements, where we layer actually five layers of bulbs in a pot with a color theme, red, white, and blue, pink, white, and purple, yellow, red, and orange, or all white, but to bloom simultaneously, not sequentially. You want to have it be a flower arrangement, all in bloom at a similar time. But that's for one season. So. Um... Yeah, and you know those short daffodils—they are so charming. The really the little dwarf ones—they are really pretty. Um, you know, and even you, you might not think you're getting much because they're so dwarf, but they are they um, are extra extra good looking plants. I and think. they they suit container gardening better. Also, they're more compact and more in the relative size to the containers, so they don't look uh, overpoweringly tall. Yeah. All right. There's another question in the chat that's interesting. It's going to take us in a little different direction. It's from Amy Bunchowski. It says, what's the uh, best way to handle the situation when you didn't get your spring bulbs in the ground in time? Can they be planted in the fall, um, held over and planted in the fall? And what's the best way to store them? And sweetheart, could you, could you buy onions or potatoes and store them for a whole year? No, they would desiccate. They would dry out. And the same with the bulbs. So, if you, I, we always get calls in the fall. I take all the horticultural phone calls. Uh, this is my office nowadays. Uh, it's a cell phone. <laughs> I enjoy talking to people. And, but in December, and January, I always get calls saying, oh, I discovered a box of bulbs in the garage. What's going to do with them? Well, the best thing, if it's really cold, is to go ahead and pot them up in some good compost type soil in your in your garage and give them that rooting at 50 to 60 degrees or they still root below that and start them there they're going to bloom later the first year 
They're also going to bloom probably uh, not as vigorously as they would had you planted them in December. But, um, you know, you can't hold them over for another season. They do have to grow uh, from one year to another. That's a bummer. So you have to get them in the ground relatively soon. Uh, but, um, oh, well. That's right. December is the night. November, October, November, and December are really great months for planting. So um, I'll remind everyone you can throw your questions in the chat while we're talking here. I'll I'll make pauses and 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 ask those questions. Um, but I'm going to ask one of mine now. Um, you mentioned you have a garden with thousands of daffodils. What are some of your favorite daffodil uh, cultivars? Well. I'm partial to those that are fragrant. I think fragrance is an added value. There are four types of fragrance. The sweet honeysuckle-like fragrance of the Jonquilla-type daffodils. It's sweet, but not cloyingly sweet. The musky sweet fragrance of the Tazetta-type daffodils. Tazetta meaning tiny cups in, in Italian, in uh, Latin, I guess. Um, they have the musky sweet fragrance. The paper whites, some people come in a room and they love the smell. They say, oh, what's that lovely fragrance? Other people come in the room and look a little sheepish and check the bottom of their shoes. Um, fragrance is a personal perception. So each of us smell things a little differently. But most of the non-paper white Tazettas have a pleasant, sweet, musky fragrance. The triandrous type, those that tend to hang their heads, um, also a smaller, uh, more compact group. Um, they have a sweet fruit-like fragrance, not as strong as the John Quillas or Tazettas, but a lovely fragrance. Our, um, our Sensation series, which are gold and soft yellow and white, all the same cross, um, have a wonderful fruit-like fragrance. And then there's the poeticus type with a spicy fragrance and um all of those are, are pretty wonderful and ones that i particularly like now i like some of the bigger ones too i like some of the big bold trumpets um they're very showy the king alfred types you know king alfred is no longer produced commercially but people remember that name and they now use it as a generic term for any yellow daffodil, unfortunately, because it's not a true name. And are the big yellow trumpets are, are showy. Marika is one of my favorites. I like ones that last for a long time and bloom and have strong stems that the wind doesn't knock over and the rain doesn't pound down. Marika is a popular Dutch girl's name. But it's one of the biggest yellow trumpets, about you know six inches or more across. Wow! And, um, yeah, and then there's one, a large cup daffodil. Trumpet means the the cup or corona proper name is longer than the perianther petal. So you bend the petal down, and the trumpet sticks out further. Um, then there are the large cups, and probably my favorite large cup daffodil is one called Ceylon, C-E-Y-L-O-N. Yes, now the country's called Sri Lanka. This one was born the same year I was introduced the same year I was, 1945. So neither of us are baby boomers. We were born a year too early. But in any event, this is one of the longest lasting bloom, one of the very early bloomers. And she stands up and looks you, looks up at you. She is an awesome. She's yellow with an orange cup. And um, she lasts for a very long time in bloom. So that's a favorite. Uh, another, if we go into the small cupped ones, um, the cup is a third the length of the petals. And I like Jamestown a lot. Now, Jamestown, not named by an American hybridizer, but an Irish hybridizer who came to visit us one time, and we took him to Jamestown. So he named one in honor of, and this one, very clear white petals, a short cup, a third the length of yellow, but a very strong grower. I put hearts in the catalog in front of those that are the strongest growers and longest lasting in bloom. 
Um, they're the ones that we list are all good ones, but I I put hearts in front of the best of the best. And then double daffodils. Double means the the pistil and stamens have the good Lord mutated them into petaloids. So you see only petals, not pistil and stamen. So um oh a favorite of mine is uh that's a hard one because I got a lot of favorites, but Tahiti is one that's a very favorite. Uh, mm -hmm. Yellow with orange uh, parent segments interspersed. Again, very long lasting. And many doubles have heavy heads and often subject to falling over. And in some cases, if you get weather extremes, some doubles actually do something called blasting. Big fat bud up there. And you wait and you wait. Then you wait for it to open and it gets nipped in the bud by a late freeze or a dry spell or too hot. But a Tahiti doesn't get blasting. So that's a good one. And Tahiti then, is fragrant too, isn't it? What's that? Tahiti is fragrant too, isn't it? Uh, all daffodils have some fragrance. The bigger ones, um, hmm. I, yeah, they have some fragrance, just it's not strong, okay? And then there are some doubles of the Jonquillas and the Tazettas, and they do have a lot of fragrance. But, um, mm -hmm. and then the next group, the Triandrus. Well, I bred one that was awesome. It was white and pink, and uh, Rebecca and I bred it. We, you know, we're only bees in the hands of the Lord. We just spread the pollen. The Lord creates them. Becky kept all the records. I I did the fun part, the sex part, with the putting the pollen on the pistol, and you wait six weeks, and you harvest black shiny seeds and plant them, and five seven years later, it's big enough to bloom for the first time, and it's so oh, exciting. It's like you're having a baby. Anyhow, we've we've been blessed. We've been through thousands and thousands of them to select out fifty that. We registered with the Royal Horticulture Society in London. Wow. That's the authority for registering daffodil names. There are already Excellent. almost 30,000 registered daffodil hybrids. Now, daily, wow. uh, Callis are way ahead of us, but it only takes them a year from seed to bloom. Mm -hmm. uh, but in any event, um, the, the um, triandrous types, um, I like the, our series called the Sensation Series. Is one bulb produces a stalk with three blooms on it, but that one bulb produces three bloom stalks. So you get you get nine or ten blooms from one bulb, and they've got that wonderful fruit-like fragrance. So golden one, uh, sun, sunshine sensation, then the soft yellow moonlight sensation, and starlight sensation for the white. Anyhow. Um, after the Tizetta, after the Triandrus, we have uh, Cyclamenius. They're the ones that Becky says look like uh, a horse with its ears held back or a dog. They, the petals flare backwards, so you've got the trumpet sticking way out, and they tend to be short. They're great for forcing because they're easy on pots, and and um, and they're most are early blooming. And they're very lovely, and they have narrow leaves. Um, and then we have the Jonquilla group, my favorite group of all. Most of our seedlings are in that group, but sweetly fragrant. And in that group, I would would probably give you uh, uh, Golden Echo. The Golden Echo is probably our longest lasting in bloom. It's nice and compact. So white parient segments are petals. But the golden cup also bleeds into the petals. So it's kind of an echo there. And um, it's been one of our most popular ones. Wonderfully sweet fragrance, very dark green leaves, a really great one. And then so that's Jonquilla Tazetta. Oh, well. I like almost all of them. Falconet is one of my all-time favorites, bred by one of my mentors, Grant Mitch in Oregon. And my father was 60 when I was born. So by the time I took over the business from my mother, uh, he was no longer around. 
but his friends all mentored me. It was wonderful. These people were so helpful to me. And um, Falconet is, was one of his. But uh, yellow and orange, five or six blooms on a stem. Great one for forcing, great one for picking. Um, really great. And then that's uh, Tizetta. Then Poeticus, um, one of the wild daffodils in Spain and Portugal and France is called Poeticus. And it was the first Narcissus to be named, and hence the poet's Narcissus. And this one's also, also one called Pheasant's Eye because very white petals, and it's where all the white come from, in, from the wild. This is the white daffodil that gives white to the rest of the group. And it's got a spicy fragrance, but a tiny little red-rimmed yellow cup. And the favorite of ours is the one mostly available called Actea. Actea was um, King Solomon's favorite concubine in the Bible, I think. Um, some people gave theirs biblical character names. Um, and from it, uh, it and its progeny, all the red and the yellow and the orange pigment come from the Poeticus types. So mm. they're the mother of many, many, many of the daffodil hybrids. And then there's a group called the split corona type daffodils. And they, the cup actually splits back their six perian segments or petals on the daffodil. And on those, the cup splits back against the perianth segment. So the cup has six parts also. And they're quite interesting and unusual. Uh, some of the daffodil fanciers, when they first started coming out back in the 50s and the 60s, called them bastard daffodils because they didn't think they looked like daffodils. Um, we have several hybrids from that group um, uh, with John with John Quilla. Um, boy, hard to tell which of your children is your favorite. <laughs> um, oh, um, smiling twin is one that we like quite a lot. It has again sometimes three flowers on a stem, and it's white and yellow. And then we've got the the species group, of which we don't offer too many of. Uh, we do for some of the. Um, period or heirloom gardens. We offer the little obvalaris, the tenby daffodil from Wales, a wild one. We offer poeticus recurvus, which is a wild one. And we ought to offer another one called, it's a Jonquilla type. You know, many people in the South miss, uh, miss um, when asked what the daffodil is, they'll, they'll call it a Jonquil. But most are not jonquils. They misuse the term. Jonquil is only the sweetly fragrant one with multiple flowers that often naturalize. And you know, naturalize means a non-native plant that recedes, not one that just grows well. But any of it, um, one of them that's a favorite is a little one called Odorus. And Odorus is actually a wild hybrid, but still considered one of the species. And they call them sweeties in parts of the South. They call them a variety of nicknames. Um, in any event, the Odorus and the Odorus Floriplino, the double one, very popular. Um, and then we get into the miniatures. And the miniatures are under six inches. And probably if I had to pick one as a favorite, I'd pick Baby Boomer. Now, Becky and I didn't really realize we'd not calculated which group we were in. And we had this little daffodil that had, it was a Jonquilla Tazetta hybrid, and it produced many flowers and strong standing up well, only six inches tall, great for growing it on pots and things, wonderful fragrance. And so we named her Baby Boomer. And then we realized we weren't baby boomers, but it, it doesn't matter, it's still a great daffodil. So sure. for miniatures, and they're the most popular, world's most popular daffodil, most numerous daffodil today is a miniature called Tatatat. -tat. It's mm -hmm. a it's a one that's often grown on pots, and actually 80% of the bulbs that are produced in the Netherlands are grown for pots or grown for picking the flowers. 
Most people, we gardeners use 20% of the bulbs that are produced. That's pretty so, amazing, isn't it? Yeah, and, and that uh, leads me to, a, we've been talking about fragrance and you just mentioned picking. Um, you gave me some great advice when we spoke before about the proper way to pick a daffodil flower. Indeed. Now, we misuse the term cut flower because you don't cut daffodils. And basically, you run your finger down the stem, put your thumb next to it, pull up and snap. You get a nice solid white base to the to the stem, and you put it right in tepid water that's warm to the touch, and that hollow above fills with water, and the flower will last longer. If you cut daffodils, you don't want to cut the leaves, so you cut up higher, and you got a hollow stem that doesn't hold water. So they last longer in bloom if you actually pick them. Excellent I used advice. to get blisters on my fingers from picking. I would, and you you pick them and put them in bunches. And we, the big deal here in Gloucester County, where there were about a thousand bulb growers back in the 30s and 40s that my grandfather started, was for picking the daffodils for the spring markets in northern cities, New York, uh, Detroit, Chicago, et cetera, Philadelphia. Uh, they would send out tractor trailer loads of daffodils from Gloucester in the early spring. They'd wow. let school out. They'd let the kids out of school to pick daffodils for a week uh, around Easter time. So anyhow, a lot of history here. So, yeah, there is. Um, so we're coming down to the end. It's 356 right now. I do want to address some of the questions that are in the chat. Uh, before we move on. And if you do have a question, now would be a great time to throw it in the chat. I'm going to start with um, Carol Kendall's uh, question, which is not about daffodils. It's about tulips. And she okay. wants to know, are there any tulips that survive more than a year in zone eight, which is Raleigh and part south these days? They, they are. It's just you've got to treat them right. Tulips native to Uzbekistan, Turkestan, Kazakhstan, high mountain deserts, cold winters, moist springs, but very hot, dry summers. They need to stay dry in the summer. If they get wet and it's humid, they catch a fungus and they rot. Darwin hybrid tulips, and not just Darwin tulips, but Darwin hybrid tulips have the best um, reputation for coming back. No mindless irrigation in the summer. That's the worst thing you can do to them. Um, plant them in raised beds. The next group that's really good are some of the species are wild tulips. And some of them are native to Europe, Western Europe, in, or Eastern Europe, sorry, instead. And the Clusiana types come back pretty well. The, the little one called Sylvestris, the woodland tulip, is naturalized at uh, Monticello, Mount Vernon, and Oatlands Plantation. It's in the Virginia uh, Pharmacopoeia, and I think also in several others, but right plant in the right place. Rock gardens where time grows, we have little tulips that grow under time very nicely. You also, we sometimes put them with stackas, lamb's ears, um, that's using the available moisture and the little clusiana coming up through the stack is, is really quite nice. My most popular talk is bulbs as companion plants. But those, and then the very early bloomers tend to do a bit better. And again, I put hearts in front of those that we've had better success with. But Darwin hybrids are the best bet. Excellent. Okay, um, so back here's the next question is back to daffodils. It's from Nancy Sutton. Um, and it's, let's see, um, she has some daffodils that did not perform well and she wants some thoughts on if it's, uh, were they, did they have a fungus or were they old? She, she says she unknowingly planted some old hold, holdovers and they did not do well this year. Um, should she replant into the same hole or new holes? or add compost or move them? If you've lost daffodils, what kills daffodils, uh, nothing eats them. So what kills daffodils is a fungus called Fusarium oxysporum, basal rot, 
And typically they get stressed, they catch basal rot and you lose them. Some types are more susceptible to others. Don't plant back in the same spot because those spores remain in the soil for a while. Plant another crop there. Our growers grow daffodils on the soil one year, tulips the next, hyacinths the next, a grain crop the next year, and a vegetable crop. And then they fumigate, not with chemicals, but with water. They kill all the life in the soil, keeping water on top of it for a couple of months. And then they re put more compost on and compost tea to build the life in the soil again and start over again. But they never grow the same crop in the same. Now, you can leave daffodils in the ground and they'll be fine as long as they, they get the light they need, and not too much water. Excellent. Uh, let's see. Um, now we have a question about caladiums here. Um, uh, how <laughs> well will they grow? In I'm sorry, what? I read the question. <laughs> oh, okay. They are wonderful annuals in our climate. They are difficult to dig and store because they will be stored at temperatures around 70 degrees. Below mm -hmm. 60 in storage, they catch a fungus and rot. Um, some people more successful than others. Uh, store them. Never wash a bulb when you dig it. Washing bruises it and a chance for the fungal spores to get in. Instead, let it dry with some soil on it. Soil is alive with bacteria and fungi and viruses and, and all the good stuff. There are only a few bad bacteria and fungus. So leave the soil on, dry it really well, and store it um, with air circulation around it. I will add that uh, Tim uh, Alderton here at the Arboretum does dig our caladiums and um, he overwinters them. He puts them in the, a mesh bag, very similar to the bag that they are shipped in. He keeps them in his office on top of his um, cabinet all winter. Um, room temperature, ignores them, doesn't touch them, doesn't do anything to them. And then, you know, plants them pretty late, uh, yeah, June or July before he plants them again. Inside if, you, if you want earlier emergence, start them inside as they don't like cold. Right. Yeah. That sounds great. Uh, let's see. Um, Marilyn wants to know how she can get some galanthus to survive after planting. She seems to have had a pretty low success rate. Okay. Some galanthus are better in our climate than others. We we find the one Elwesii tends to naturalize for us. And remember, naturalize means to reseed and spread. They are shade tolerant. They're not shade lovers. They'll grow in full sun. I never kill a plant twice in the same spot. If I if it doesn't grow for me here, I look for an opposite microclimate to put it in. And plantus, once they're growing, nothing eats them. It's just finding that right spot. And I do have several spots where they've naturalized nicely. Um, one is under some surprisingly maples with ornamental maples with their fibrous root systems, but that may keep them drier in the winter, in the summertime. Um, I have some um, coming up in, I'm trying to get rid of all the English ivy. I don't think, think we call too many plants invasive, but I do think English ivy, is, particularly when it climbs trees. But I have some coming up in English ivy, and they seem to do beautifully. Um, hmm. They're just finding the right spot. All right, Marilyn, so keep on trying. Uh, now, you mentioned the, the word naturalizing just a second ago as a plant that's going to spread around via seed. Uh, you and I had a real interesting conversation a while back about there's another term, perennializing. Uh, if you would yeah. tell the audience about that. Well, most bulbs multiply. They can multiply by seed if visited by pollinators. Uh, daffodils are not visited by pollinators and hence don't set seeds naturally, you have to be the pollinator. However, um, perennialize, almost all bulbs multiplied by division. So when the clump 
you plant one bulb, next year you have two, then four, and then eight, 16, 30. And sometimes they don't multiply that quickly. But you get a big clump and they come back well year after year. The big thing you need to do is feed your soil. Feed your soil, plenty of organic matter, compost. And I have daffodils in my field that I've not dug for 30 years. They still bloom beautifully. I do top dress with compost every winter. So that's what perennialized means, coming back every year. Will um, daffodils ever crowd themselves out over time that you need to divide them and spread them? And spread that them is apart? a possibility. And the best time to do that is eight to 10 weeks after they bloom, but before the leaves die. You don't want to be spearing bulbs you can't see under the soil. Take your hand, grab the clump of leaves, put your spading fork right down beside it, gently lift, pry up. Gently shake the soil off. Uh, if the bulbs are visibly attached, don't separate them. The daughters are not ready to leave their mothers yet. And, um, and you can take them and plant them right back again. If you need to hold them out over the summer, the important thing is dry, dry, and dry. Now, and warm. Don't put them in a cool place. Plenty of air circulation. And then the bulbs won't catch a fungus and rot. And then Excellent. plant them back in the fall after the soil cools. But you can plant them right back after you dig them without any problem at all. Excellent. All right. Well, that seems the questions seem to have petered out on the chat. If does anyone want to unmute and ask a question real quick? Otherwise, um, we are a little bit past our time. We can go ahead and finish up here. And I'm sorry, I dominated with daffodils. There are lots of other bulbs, so maybe we'll do another one sometime. Yeah, that'd be great. We'd love to have you. Good. All right, everyone. Well, um, thank you for coming to uh, this week's Midweek with Mark. And I'm going to sign off for Blake. And um, we will see you uh, next week. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And Brent, thanks a whole lot for coming out. It was a joy to have you and listen to you speak. Well, I appreciate it. I enjoy it. And meant to invite people to come visit us. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you have an Airbnb up there, so you can go and visit him. We do. Rent, rent a house, also, uh, stay in it, and actually go visit, walk through his own garden. And you have a music venue, too, nearby? We do. It's coming kind of, we next door, across the street. And... And um, our garden is open every day from nine till four, except Sundays. We and except during the wine festival, we do have it open on Sunday. Wine festival the second weekend in April. Be a couple of bands in the garden, ten or fifteen wineries throughout. We'll get twenty five hundred people here. It's a great time. Get a lot right. of hugs that day. Yeah, big party. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Brent. I appreciate it. And well, uh, thank you. And everyone have a great week and we will see you next week. All right. Bye everyone.